Psalm 124, uh, which will be found on page 623. <coughs> if the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, If the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, they would have swallowed us alive. The flood would have engulfed us, the torrent would have swept over us, the raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord, who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird out of the foulest snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Our second reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 9, starting at verse 38. You'll find it on page 1013 in the Church Bibles. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm just going to pray for Rachel now. She bring God, brings God's word. So, Father, we just thank you for Rachel and her willingness to come and serve us here this morning. And we pray again, Lord, that you would fill her with your spirit, that the words she speaks would have the power to come and change our lives. That you, Lord, by your spirit, would not leave one of us unchanged this morning. We pray that as she serves us, you would also bless her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a real privilege to be with you this morning, and thank you so much for having me. As Helen already said, um, my name is Rachel. I've come down from Stopsy Baptist Church to be with you this morning and uh, bring greetings from them to you today. Um, And I've just been invited to share with you for the next few minutes or so on one of the passages that we've just heard read to us so well. Thank you for that. Um, I'm looking at Mark 9 together, but before we uh, get into that, I just thought I'd introduce myself to you, let you know a little bit about who I am. Um, As I said, I'm from Stopsy Baptist Church. I've been part of that church for about 23 years now, and I've been a Christian for the same amount of time. Um, And my involvement at SBC has been wide-ranging, everything from children's work, youth work, short-term mission, um, and currently I'm part of the Alpha, help lead the Alpha teams. I also am part of the worship team on a regular basis. And in March this year, I was invited to join the eldership, so I'm now an elder at SBC as well, which is a tremendous privilege. Um, but outside of school, um, outside of uh, church life, I should say, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. I, um, I teach primary school, and uh, I have a year one class, so they are five and six years old. 
um, and I have 28 of them. So I can see the horror on some people's faces thinking, oh, I'm going to control 28 very small children. But actually, they're absolutely fantastic, and I, love, I absolutely love my job. I lead the year one team of teachers and support staff, um, so I'm part of the senior leadership team of the school as well. And, uh, and I absolutely love it. I've been, there, I've been working as a teacher now for about 12 years, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but when I was training as a teacher, <coughs> in my holidays, I would come back to Luton, and I worked part-time at a local children's nursery, not far from here. And it was there that I came across something called the Toddler's Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know if anyone is familiar with these, but I thought I would share them with you this morning. Um, so if you have a toddler, or if you um, have worked with small children, or indeed you were a toddler yourself at one point, you might actually recognize quite a few of these. So here they are, Toddler's Ten Commandments. Number one, if I like it, it's mine. Number two, if it's in my hand, it's mine. Three, if it's in your hand, but I can take it from you, it's mine. Four, if I had it a little while ago, it's mine. Five, if I wish I'd had it a little while ago, it's mine. Six, if it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way whatsoever. Seven, if I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. Eight, if it looks just like mine, it is mine. Nine, if I think it's mine, it's mine. And ten, if it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> you know, and we laugh about these things, you know, because we recognize an awful lot of them. But the reality is, is that those things are rooted in selfishness. And the most common complaint that I get from the children that I work with on a regular basis is they're not sharing. They come up to me all the time, Miss, they're not sharing, they're not sharing. And what they're actually, the translation is, is that they've got the thing that I want to play with and they won't hand it over to me right now. That's what they're saying. And my solution usually involves a fat five minute sand timer and uh, within two minutes they've usually handed it over to their friend and all is forgotten. But all of that stems from jealousy. And when you look at this um, section in Mark's Gospel, in chapter nine, from verse 38 down to the end, the disciples have come to Jesus and they're complaining. And they're complaining out of jealousy. And it's clearly a time of a bit of tension in the group because earlier in this chapter, they have been having this argument about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who is going to get that coveted seat at the right hand of Jesus Christ when he comes back to reign on the earth? They obviously are all trying to assert their own authority. They're trying to get a bit of one-upmanship going on. You know, who is, who's going to be the greatest? Who's the, who's the best one amongst us? And now what's happened is that they've seen this guy who isn't part of their group, shock horror, and he is casting out demons in Jesus' name and bristling with indignation. They go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, this guy is doing this and it's just not right. He's not part of our group. How dare he? How dare he have the, the temerity to have a go at doing this? You know, that's our job. We're part of your entourage. That, that, that's our job. It's not his job. You need to go and tell him to stop. It isn't right. And Jesus has a very interesting response. I'm going to come to that in a second. When I was growing up, um, I grew up on a diet of old British comedies. And uh, so Saturday nights used to be filled with things like To the Manor Born and uh, Dad's Army. And... Um, and particularly Dad's Army, it made me think that, you know, it's a comedy based on the antics of a home guard um, at a little seaside town in the south of England and in the middle of World War II. And uh, there are a lot of famous phrases that came out of that show, some of which we still tease each other with at home in my family. Um, but there was a, there's a character of Mr. Jones, who was the local butcher, and his phrase was, does anyone know what it was? Don't panic, Captain Mannering. That's what he was always saying. Um, and then there was the miserable Scottish undertaker who was always telling everybody that we're doomed the whole time. But one of the most common phrases that was in that show, which a lot of the characters said, was, don't you know there's a war on? Don't you know there's a war on? And effectively, that is what Jesus' response is to the disciples in this passage. Don't you know that there is a war on? Tom Wright who was the Bishop of Durham, in his commentary on Mark, he says this. He says, Jesus implies that his disciples don't know that there's a war on. 
There is a serious business afoot which will have serious consequences. And unless they realize this, they will be in real danger. Battle has been joined. Martial law is now appropriate. If the disciples are to be Jesus' associates in the final and vital stage of his plan, they must sort out their ideas and see things from his strategic point of view. In other words, Jesus is saying to them, guys, you're missing the point. It's not about who does it. That's not the important thing. The point is the work is being done at all. And Jesus has the big picture. And he knows that his message and his way of doing things are open to absolutely anyone who will believe. Now, I have to be honest, I don't totally blame the disciples for not getting it. Because if you think about it, they've been brought up in the Jewish faith. And Judaism taught that the favor of God was only for those with exclusive membership to an elite chosen club. That's what it was all about. Who you were really mattered. And the disciples mistakenly thought that the same still applied. But Jesus is being radically different, and now they have to learn that it's open season for anyone who wants to join. Anyone at all. Because this is a battle for human souls, and they need to enlist as many soldiers as are willing to join in. So Jesus says to them, don't stop him. He is doing the right thing. In verse 40, he says, anyone who is not against us is for us. And Jesus then goes on to list a rather nasty series of consequences for anyone who's found guilty of putting someone off their faith. You know, God takes that really seriously. If my disgruntled whinging about the chairs not being in the right place on a Sunday morning when I come to church means that someone's face disintegrates because I do it again and again and again and again and it wears them down, I'm going to have to answer for that at some point. And that might sound like a really ridiculous example, but actually putting out the chairs in the right order, making the area of worship right, is a ministry to somebody. And it's really important. And if we, we come up to them and we complain that it's not being done in the right way, it's not being done the way that we would want it done, actually, we can cause real hurt and we can cause real pain to people and sometimes actually drive them out and put them, put them off completely. And it's a really serious, really serious thing. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, then you'll know that your walk with Jesus is about putting others first. It's about sharing the love of God. But I also believe that there is a justifiably selfish element to it as well. You may wonder what I'm going on about. But at the end of his ministry on earth, after the resurrection, in John 21, Jesus is having a chat with Simon Peter about what his future calling is going to be. And the interesting thing about this conversation is that Peter is far more interested in what John's going to be doing. It's almost as if he's saying, you know what, Jesus, I'm really, really pleased that you're going to make me the rock on which you build your church. That's fantastic. Thanks for that. But what's he going to be doing? What's this guy over here going to be doing? And Jesus basically says, do you know what, Simon, Peter? That is none of your business. If I want him to do, you know, if I want him to live for a very, very long time, if I want him to set up a thousand churches, that is his calling. It's not yours. I want you to focus on the thing that I have asked you to do. In this regard, I want you to be selfish. What have you been told to get on with? What have you been called to do? And I'm not necessarily talking about the idea of where your life is going, because not everyone knows that. But earlier we sang, shine your light and let the whole world see. That was one of the, that were the words that we sang together. And we, each of us who believe in Jesus, if you've accepted him as your saviour, then we have a daily charge of sharing the news of who Jesus is and how he has impacted your life. That's what you've been called to do. That's what you've been told to get on with. So when we return to Mark 9, in verse 50, I think in the, um, in the translation that was read to us this morning, it says, um, have salt in yourselves. But when I was, uh, I was looking into this, um, the New Living Translation, it's, it says it this way. So I'm just going to read you the verse in, in that translation. It says, salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? You must have the qualities of salt among yourselves, and live in peace with each other. 
So when I was preparing this, I was thinking to myself, that particular verse really jumped out at me. And I thought, what is Jesus going on about? Why is this illustration about Christ followers being like salt so important? Because it's not the only time it crops up in Scripture. You see it in Matthew 5. It also appears in Luke 14. To us in the 21st century, it perhaps means less than to a first century audience. So I really wanted to get to the bottom of why Jesus uses this again and again and again, and why it is such a significant picture. So I thought I'd do a little bit of research. I thought I'd share some of that with you, all about salt. Amazing what you can find out on the internet. I found out, for example, that um, any English town with the um, with W I C H, which at the end of it, that uh, that particular um, suffix means a, salt, a source of salt. So, for example, Norwich and Ipswich, places where salt came from. But that was just a, an aside, really. But um, I actually discovered that salt has over 14,000 different uses. 14,000. You will be glad to know that I am not going to list every single one of them now because we could be here a very long time if I did. But just to give you um, an idea, it's used in paper manufacture. It's used in food preparation and preservation, perhaps the one that most of us are most familiar with. Um, it's used for de-icing the roads in the winter. It's used in agriculture. Um, it's used in science and technology. Apparently, someone has recently invented a salt-powered clock. Don't know how that works, but apparently they have. And it's also used in building. Um, there is apparently a salt hotel in Bolivia built of over one million salt blocks. Who knew? Um, but to Jesus' audience, there were other more significant ones. And four of these are the ones that I really want to focus on this morning to give us a better picture of how we should live our lives in Christ. So, having the qualities of salt. In Jesus' day, salt was highly valuable. Now, that may not make a great deal of sense to us because you can just go to your local supermarket and pick up a huge bag of it for just over a pound. But actually, in, you know, in the first century, it was so valuable that Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt. And it literally was worth its weight in gold. And it's where we get our word salary from. And because sal means salt in Latin. And as a member of God's family through Jesus, you need to know that you are of high worth. You are, valu you are valuable in the kingdom of God. And there are so many verses throughout scripture that highlight just how valuable you are. When I was at university, I used to uh, plaster them all over my walls in my bedroom so that they would be the first thing that I saw when I woke up. And in fact, the one over my mirror, I think it said, um, you are holy and dearly loved. So every time I looked in the mirror, that was what I saw. And I, I knew that that's what God says over my life. And it reminded me of who I am in Christ. Now, when you know that you are deeply loved and you are valued by God, it makes the realization that you and I are the currency through which God transacts his business on earth so much easier to manage. Because when you know you're loved, you want to go out and tell other people. You want to go out and tell other people that they're loved too. So if you're going to have qualities of salt, learn to recognize and believe that God loves you, that he knows who you are, and he is deeply interested in everything concerning you. So that was the first thing, you're valuable. Secondly, qualities of salt. Well, salt was, and still is, I'm given to believe, a sign of hospitality. Bread and salt would be offered to guests as a welcome on the entered, on entered homes. And as Christians, we're called to be hospitable. We're called to open our doors, our homes, to give of our resources, our time, our gifts, our talents, whatever we've got, in order that other people could hear about Jesus and, learn and have an opportunity to respond to him. You know, but sometimes there's a cost involved in being hospitable. And at the moment, um, at Stopsley, we are trying to gauge our response to the refugee crisis. We prayed, we prayed about it this morning. Um, earlier this week, one of our Arabic-speaking church members flew out to Greece and um, went to Lesbos and was 
with the refugees and spent time in the camps working with them, talking to them, basically finding out what it is that they need, um, what the appropriate response would be for us as a church, and so we're waiting on him to come back and tell us and, and to report back to us so that we can respond in the right way. But the reality is, is that being hospitable is going to have an impact. And if you are hospitable, it's going to have an impact on you and on your family. And the church needs to be ready with its response. So having the qualities of salt in this situation, or in any way that we see a need, means learning to have a hospitable, giving heart, which shares love with anyone who needs it. So we're valuable. We're called to be hospitable. Thirdly, salt was used in healing. And many cultures believed it had magical properties. You know, we're called to bring healing and restoration to situations. But if you've ever put salt on an ulcer or got it in a cut, you'll know it really, really hurts. It, it's, it's really painful. And so salt is almost an irritant as well. And I'm not saying for a second that Christians should be irritating. You know, and that's, that's, not what I'm, that's not what I'm up here saying. But we are called to tell the truth in love. And that can be painful at first, but the healing that can follow is worth it when it's done in the right way. I often find myself in this situation where I have to um, tell somebody the truth, and there are times when it backfires. I'll be honest, there are times when the person isn't ready to hear what it is that I've got to tell them, or they, they're not willing to hear it for whatever reason, and it can cause, they feel offended, and they don't want to speak to me anymore. But I have to take that risk, because I know that that's what sometimes I'm asked to do. But it has to be done in the right way. It has to be done in love. And so having the qualities of salt here means that being willing to speak the truth, even when there's a risk involved, a risk that you might be rejected or made to look foolish for speaking out, we still have to do it, despite that. So you're valuable. You're called to be hospitable. You're called to bring truth in love and see healing happen in the lives of individuals. Could seem, perhaps, that having the qualities of salt is quite a burden of responsibility. But the good news, there is good news, the good news is that none of this is to be done in our own strength. None of this is to be done on our own, but rather through the strength of Jesus Christ, working through us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And it's here that we discover the most important quality of salt that's actually found in Jesus himself. It was the one that I got most excited about. <laughs> salt is essential for life, absolutely essential. Our bodies actually need it in order to function. In fact, to be absolutely precise, we need 250 grams of it. And without it, we become chemically unbalanced, our muscles and our nervous system would shut down and we would die. That, that's how essential, that's, that is actually how desperately we need it. And the thing about this essential chemical is that we can't actually produce it ourselves. Our body is completely incapable of producing it for itself, but we desperately need it in order to have life. And in the same way, the hope of the message that we have to share is not one that we can produce by ourselves. Without Jesus, life becomes unbalanced and we die. And I don't know if you're sat here this morning and you don't know Jesus for yourself. I don't know where each of you are on that journey. But if that is you, and you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, <laughs> and you're thinking, I don't understand any of this, because you've never actually taken that step and asked Jesus into your life. If that is you this morning, I would beg you, please don't leave here without asking somebody about it. Don't leave here without having perhaps asked that question that's burning within you. You know, what is, what is this Jesus stuff all about? What can he do in my life? What difference can he make? If that is you, I'm sure there are loads of people here who would be more than willing to have that conversation with you and to speak with you about who Jesus is and what he's done for them. So, there's so much of it. I, I just love this. I, the, when you look into these passages and you think, what is Jesus going on about? And you suddenly unpack it and you realize there is so much more than it first meets the eye. So we're valuable. We're called to be hospitable. We are called to um, speak the truth in love and to see healing. But importantly, Jesus 
is in, he's absolutely essential. Salt is essential for our life. Jesus is essential for who we are and uh, how we live our lives. Because we have an absolutely essential message to share with people. Bill Hybels is um, the senior pastor of um, Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago. And he's one of my probably favorite speakers, leaders, teachers. I just think he's amazing. But he's quoted as saying, the local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. That's who we are, folks. There is no plan B. It's us. And I really wanted to leave you with a question to have a think about. Where are you going to be salt this week? What situation do you need to bring healing into? Where do you need to speak truth that perhaps might sting initially, but in love will bring healing? How can you show hospitality to somebody this week who doesn't know Christ? You know, whatever lies ahead of each of us, and some of it we know about, some of it is already in our diaries, we know, it's, we know it's coming this week, next week, the months ahead, the year ahead. But sometimes those opportunities arise that we didn't foresee, we didn't plan for. Whatever lies ahead of you this week and wherever you find yourself, ask yourself, how am I going to be salty? Jesus, I just want to thank you for the message that you have given us to share, for what you have done in each and every one of our lives, what you're continuing to do. And I want to pray that you would make yourself tangibly known to each of us this week as we leave this building, as we go out to wherever we find ourselves, whether it be the office, whether it be college, school, or maybe even network, social networking. Um, whatever it is that we find ourselves doing this week, I pray that you would remind us to have those qualities of salt, that you would remind us that we are called to represent you, to be your ambassadors, and to speak truth, to be hospitable, but all the time knowing that we are deeply, deeply valued and loved by you. So Father, I just want to pray your blessing over everyone here and ask that you would go with us in Jesus' name. Amen.